Hello everyone. I'm Marsha Mott and welcome to the UF Health Wellness University webinar. Thank you for joining us today as we discuss ear infections in children. I'd like to introduce you to our speaker, Dr. William Collins. Dr. Collins graduated from the University of Miami Medical School in Miami, Florida, where he also completed a residency in otolaryngology, head and neck surgery, and a fellowship in rhinology and advanced endoscopic sinus surgery. He then went on to complete a fellowship in pediatric otolaryngology at George Washington University. Prior to joining the faculty of the UF College of Medicine, Dr. Collins was an assistant professor at the Children's National Medical Center in George Washington University. Currently, Dr. Collins serves as a professor and chief of pediatric otolaryngology at the University of Florida. Today, if you have any questions for your, our speaker, you can submit your questions at any time using the Q&A button at the bottom of the screen. <clears throat> Please feel free to submit your questions anonymously. At the end of the presentation, I will ask all the questions anonymously. We'll try to get through as many questions as we can today. And um, I thank you guys for your time and thank you for joining us today. Dr. Collins, I'm gonna turn it over to you now. Thank you. Great, thank you, Marsha, I appreciate it. And I appreciate everyone um, taking their um, time in the middle of a busy day like this to, um, to come learn about a, a topic that is uh, important to what I do and, and we see a lot of these patients. Um, are you able to see my screen? Yep, everything looks great. All right, perfect. So I will go ahead and get started. And um, Marsha just mentioned a little bit of my background. So I am a pediatric ear, nose, and throat surgeon. Don't be alarmed by the, the big fancy terminology of otolaryngology. So I deal with children who have disorders of the head and neck area. And one of the most common things that we see is ear infections. So over the course of, of this next uh, 45 minutes or so, I wanna give you, a, you know, an overview and kind of learn you know, how much more there is to the ear than just what the eye can see on the outside. We'll, learn a little bit about how the ear works on the inside, some common conditions um, that, that children suffer from, and then our, our potential uh, treatments that we can offer for these patients. So just to give you a quick overview, we sort of step-by-step step in what we're gonna talk about um, today. So let's talk about, first of all, the anatomy of the ear. Um, <clears throat> so obviously what you can see on the outside of the ear um, in the ear canal, um, but there's a lot more to it than that. So we divide the ear into three main components, the outer ear, the middle ear, and the inner ear. So the outer ear it comprises the oracle or pinna that you see on the outside, as well as the ear canal, and that is lined by, by skin, and there are microscopic little um, glands in there that produce ear wax. Now the middle ear space, um, is the space behind the eardrum. So the ear canal is a, is a tunnel that ends with an eardrum here. And then the space behind that is what we call the middle ear space. And then lastly, there is the inner ear. And the inner ear comprises the cochlea, which is the center for hearing, and three semicircular canals, which are the, the centers for uh, balance. So when you talk about ear infections, we have to be very specific um, in what area um, we, are, we are referring to where the infection is. Now, to understand a little bit about the, the ramifications of, of ear infections, it is important too to, to understand the mechanism. How does the ear work, um, particularly as it relates to hearing? So um, maybe aging myself a little bit here, but um, so here's a, a good old fashioned boom box. So that produces sound and sound produces these acoustic waves that are captured by the, you know, the cup shape of the external ear or the oracle. And it kind of funnels those sound waves into the ear canal. Um, these come in and they hit the eardrum. And just like a drum, um, that eardrum will vibrate. And it's important that the eardrum is tight, again, like the top of a drum. And that vibration will be transmitted to the three little tiny bones of hearing in the middle ear space. And those are known as the malleus, the incus, and the stapes, or as you may have learned in, in school, 
the hammer or the anvil in the stirrup, just based on their, their rough approximation of their, their shape and configuration. So the eardrum vibrates, the three little bones vibrate with the sound waves, and then the foot plate, there's a little oval ending to this third little hearing bone that fits in a little window, almost like a piston. And that sound wave is then transmitted and it becomes a fluid wave in the inner ear. And as that fluid wave is pushed through here, it generates an electrical stimulus um, that is then carried to the brain via the hearing nerves. So the, the sound is, starts as an acoustic mechanical sound wave, vibrates these structures, and then turns into a fluid wave, which then turns into an electrical impulse. So what are ear infections? If you think about you know, that term, very often when patients come to me, that's the chief complaint. That's what the, the pediatrician refers them to. But I need to ensure that, that I'm understanding the patient's condition properly and what is an ear infection. So the same way we go back to the three parts of the ear with the outer ear, the middle ear and the inner ear. There are outer ear canal infections. Um, most commonly, this is something you may have heard referred to as swimmer's ear, otitis externa. Um, basically, that is an inflammation of the skin of the ear canal. Um, that is different than a middle ear infection. And the middle ear infection is the most common thing that we see, particularly in younger children. And that involves this area, again, behind the eardrum here. So we can't see directly in that space, but we do have a little semi-translucent window into that middle ear space, which is the eardrum. Um, now you can also get inner ear infections. These are not very common, um, especially not very common in children. And these would be things like labyrinthitis, um, and which could even lead to meningitis. So those are pretty unusual for the for the purposes of today's talk, we're going to be talking specifically about middle ear infections, which are the most common thing that we see, um, the most common type of ear infection that we see in children. So why do kids get middle ear infections? And this is a, you know, a very common question that I get from parents. So age is a big one. So younger kids, um, infants, toddlers, preschool age, are more predisposed to ear infections for reasons that we will discuss. Um, basically, anything that causes nasal congestion um, can do it as well. So secondhand smoke um, is another big risk factor. Um, pacifier use is another one in that it, it creates a negative pressure in the back of the throat and nose. Um, and we'll go over the, the anatomy and the rationale behind that here shortly. Um, Attendance in daycare settings is a big one. Um, one of the, the pediatricians um, in town, I've heard him refer to daycare as the viral exchange program because kids pass these common respiratory viruses back and forth, which then leads to nasal congestion, backs up the ear, um, and allergies um, can do it as well. So basically, you know, younger children for anatomic reasons are predisposed. Um, to middle ear infections and middle ear disease and anything that causes nasal congestion um, can contribute to that as well. Most commonly viral respiratory infections and uh, uh, inhalant and respiratory allergies. So why are kids more commonly you know, at risk for middle ear infections? And it really kind of comes down to this structure here, the eustachian tube. So the eustachian tube is a mucous membrane line tube. It's partially encased in cartilage, partially encased in bone with muscles that attach to it. But it connects the middle ear space behind the eardrum with the back of the nose. And this area um, is, again, as I mentioned, is also lined by mucous membranes. So that is one reason why anything that causes nasal congestion or nasal obstruction would... Um, would also clog this tube up. Now this tube is, is very small. It's difficult to see. You can't really see it well on CAT scans or MRIs or any other type of x-rays. Um, you, you, it's very difficult to put a camera in there. And it is also a dynamic structure. And what I mean by that is that this eustachian tube 
has to open at the right time and it has to close at the right time. So if there's fluid buildup in here, it needs to be able to open and drain that fluid. Um, if there is, you know, if, if children have a sinus infection and the back of the nose is filled with mucus and bacteria, this needs to close. So it protects the middle ear space from that. So it, it's a very small, seemingly insignificant, yet critical structure that will promote normal middle ear function. Now, the other factor in children is that the eustachian tube is shorter and it's flatter. And as they grow, it lengthens out, which provides a little more protection from bacteria in the nose being sucked up into the middle ear space. And as it grows, it becomes a little bit more vertical as well. So gravity will drain that fluid out of there. So this is really the critical structure here um, in explaining why young children are more prone to middle ear infections when you compare that to adults. So what do you do about these things? How do you, there are risk factors you can control and there are risk factors you can't. So obviously as kids grow, um, as they grow, the eustachian tube changes in orientation and size and starts to work a little bit better. Um, and then obviously some of these things, if you can eliminate them, that would be ideal. Um, genetics does play a role. We see very commonly that in parents who had a history of middle ear infections as a child, their children are more likely to have middle ear infections. Um, we see that in siblings as well. So certain things you can't change. You can't change your genetics, um, but some of these other risk factors, such as you know trying to minimize you know the exposure to typical respiratory viruses and, and management of allergies, um, can help prevent middle ear infections. So when I say middle ear infections or ear infections, there are a couple of different types, um, and this is important to to you know, understand what are the treatments and what are the expectations for treatment. So of the two most common types of middle ear infections, we have the acute ear infections or acute otitis media. And then we have basically just fluid in the middle ear, or what we call otitis media with effusion. So let's talk about this first one. So the acute otitis media. So this is the classic ear infection. So this is what we would consider an eardrum of a child who has an acute ear infection. So compare that with what a normal eardrum looks like. And as I mentioned earlier, the normal eardrum is, it's not completely transparent. It's almost, almost has like a frosted glass appearance. So you can sort of see through it, um, but it's not, as, it's not as though you have a, a clear window into the middle ear space. But compare a normal eardrum with this one. And you can see this one is bulging. You can, these little red streaks here are, are inflamed blood vessels and you get a sense there's something white behind this and pushing and that's pus. So an acute ear infection is basically pus behind the eardrum. Um, it's almost like a, an abscess in that space. Now, the definition of acute otitis media um, kind of follows exactly the, the wording here. So acute. Um, it is rapid onset. It's the rapid onset of signs and symptoms of middle ear inflammation. So by acute, we're usually talking the symptoms develop over 24 to 48, maybe even 72 hours. So this is an acute problem that develops. Um, itis refers to inflammation. So any tonsillitis is inflammation of the tonsils. Appendicitis is inflammation of the appendix. So otic means refers to the ear and media is the middle ear. So it's inflammation of the middle ear. So again, it's rapid onset signs and symptoms of middle ear inflammation. So what are those symptoms? And anybody who's, who's had small children probably has, has had at least a few sleepless nights with these. So ear pain is a big one. Um, as you can imagine with this pus pushing on that eardrum, it's creating pressure, which translates into ear pain. Um, often there's fevers associated with this. 
the smaller children or younger children react a little bit differently. So if they're not feeling well, they may not sleep well, they may not eat well, they'll be fussy, irritable. They may not be old enough to tell their parents or their caregivers that their ear hurts or localize it to an ear. But they clearly, in, in a case of acute otitis media or an acute middle ear infection, they clearly act differently. They are symptomatic. Um, and in many cases, they are, they are frankly miserable. So what do we do with this? When we look in a, in a child's ear and they're having fevers and they're uncomfortable, um, believe it or not, you know, there is an approach of watchful waiting. Uh, not all ear infections need to be immediately treated with antibiotics. So you know, our intent in, as a medical community in not over-treating with antibiotics, we're not trying to make anybody miserable or prolong the pain of children. So if children are um, you know, severely affected, they have high fevers, you know, there's severe ear pain where they're not sleeping all night and they have on, on their examination what looks like pus behind the eardrum, then we would recommend treating those. But in older kids, if it might be only in one ear and the symptoms are less severe, then watchful waiting um, is a very reasonable option. Um, if that is the strategy, there also has to be a, a plan B, so to speak, that if the child's symptoms worsen over time, um, that there is a, a mechanism or a way to get the child seen again or reevaluated and, and a, a, the possibility of then treating with, with antibiotics. Um, as I mentioned, younger kids were more likely to treat because they may not always manifest symptoms the same way as older kids. Um, those with severe symptoms, so really high fevers, you know, not sleeping, not eating, um, we're much more likely to, to treat those patients. And it is an infection, so we're going to treat it with antibiotics if that's indicated. Um, most commonly, it's amoxicillin or you know, very common broad-spectrum antibiotic. Um, and if, you know, if patients don't respond to that or have a second ear infection you know, within a few weeks, we will gradually escalate it you know, to things like Augmentin or Ceftonir or, or even Rocephin shots. So in general, yes, I think the, the key point is there are some patients that are good candidates for watchful waiting um, and not all kids need to be immediately treated um, for every acute ear infection. So a second type of middle ear infection is, is again, otitis media with effusion. And as we mentioned, that this refers to the middle ear space and effusion is just a fancy word for fluid. Um, this condition actually has a number of different names that you may read about on the internet or, or, or referred to um, in different circles. So some refer to it as serous otitis media, serous being the, the nature of the fluid. Um, some call it secretory otitis media. There's also a term called glue ear because it can be really, really thick mucus in there. Um, so there are different names for this, but essentially this is fluid behind the eardrum. And again, if you look at a normal eardrum and then you look at a, a patient with otitis media with effusion, you can see bubbles here. You can see the line of fluid. This was a picture that I took in a patient who was sitting up in clinic. So the fluid kind of layered out. And you can tell, although the eardrum again is not perfectly translucent, you can tell that this fluid looks more like kind of watery or yellow watery. Um, in nature, as opposed to the earlier pictures of an acute ear infection where there was pus behind the eardrum just pushing, um, creating pressure on that eardrum. So this is a kind of a classic um, uh, view of a child with middle ear fluid that's not infected. So they get fluid in this space back here. So it's trapped behind the eardrum and it's not draining down the eustachian tube here. Uh, now, surprisingly, these patients will often have very few symptoms. Uh, because it's not infected, it's not you know, expanding and putting pressure. Um, it's not filled with pus with an acute bacterial infection. They usually, these patients will not have fevers. Um, they may complain of some mild ear pressure or pain. But the big, big thing that we watch out for in these situations is hearing loss. So if you think about how that hearing mechanism works, sound wave comes in here, vibrates the eardrum, and then gets transmitted in here, well, that fluid attenuates it. So it's very much like you're underwater. Um, it's just that the water, instead of being out here, as if you were jumping in the, a pool or at the beach, 
instead of the water being out here and filling the ear canal, the water is on the inside. And the sound of the way the human ear is designed, the sound waves do not transmit as efficiently when they're going through fluid. So hearing loss is a big concern in patients with you know, just fluid in the middle ear space or otitis media with effusion. Now, the reason we care about hearing loss, particularly in younger children, is that is a very critical age and time for speech development. And if you've ever noticed, um, if you turn on a movie with a few curse words or say something in front of a child, they learn to talk by imitating. And they need to hear things. Their brain kind of processes that sound and then they repeat it back. So it's important, a, a, a big factor when we're evaluating patients who have some sort of speech delay or speech difficulties is we want to ensure that their hearing is adequate for speech development. And in that younger age group, you know, this is, a, is, a, is often a critical factor in that. So it's not an infection necessarily. It's not a acute bacterial infection. So we, we do not recommend treatment with antibiotics for asymptomatic fluid. So patients just happen to have fluid in their ears like this child does. And again, you can see the bubbles and the fluid level there. Um, we do not recommend antibiotics as opposed to this case where if this child is severely affected and is, you know, is having high fevers and severe ear pain, this we would treat with antibiotics, this we would not. But this is a result of that eustachian tube backing up and not working efficiently. So we do try to treat the underlying cause. Unfortunately, there is not a, a treatment that provides you know, high reliability or a very high success rate. But if patients have, you know, concomitant, you know, inhalant or respiratory allergies, we would certainly recommend treating that. Um, trying to avoid a repeated cycle of viral upper respiratory infections as well. Um, so anything we can do to get the nose working better um, will help the middle ear drain that fluid and return to function a little bit quicker. Now, it's also important to realize that this state over time will lead to this state, which would eventually resolve in the vast majority of children. So um, this is from a, a, a study that was done up in Boston in school children. And at the beginning of this, they looked at kids who had a single episode of acute otitis media or an acute middle ear infection. So by definition, they had pus in their ear or behind their eardrum in the middle ear space. So all of them had fluid when they started. And over time, that fluid gradually gets better. Now notice, you know, at a month, maybe, you know, 60% of those kids, that fluid was still there. It gets less and less, but by about three months, 90% of kids after a single episode of an acute middle ear infection, 90% of those kids, that fluid will clear up. It's only that last 10% that kind of levels out. So that last 10% isn't likely to clear up on its own. So it, the, the, the important message here is that if a child's treated for an ear infection and they go back in a month later, if they just have fluid in their ears, that is no reason for panic or alarm. That's part of the normal course. Now, if they have an ear infection and come back in six months and they still have fluid, that's when we really want to do a, a thorough hearing assessment, evaluate them for their speech development. So it's really that three month mark that's kind of critical for us in patients that just have fluid. So if you know, a patient has an ear infection, they have fluid for a month or two, no big deal, something we can, we can monitor. Hey, Dr. So, can I interrupt for a second? We have someone who had a question that was really relevant to that and they had to get going pretty quick. And so they're coming to see, um, I believe you guys in a week or so, and they okay. think their child is getting an ear infection now. Mm -hmm. When the child comes in to be seen, is, is that you guys won't want to see them because they have an ear infection now and you won't want to, they're kind of sure, not sure what they should be doing right mm -hmm. now while they're like waiting. You know, are you guys going to cancel right. the appointment because they have an ear infection? You can't really look at their ear very well. Right. No, not at all. Not at all. Um, you know, by just by virtue of our our practice, since we're subspecialists, we we often are not seeing the children on a day that they're getting an, 
you know, that they happen to have an acute infection. Um, but we would, we would certainly not turn away a patient if they have an infection that day. Um, if they are symptomatic, we would accordingly you know, recommend antibiotics and prescribe those, but um, it wouldn't be it wouldn't be a reason not to see us if they, if they have an infection on that particular day. Okay. Now it, it can, it can cloud the, the um, decision-making a little bit because we don't know, you know, how long the, the middle ear fluid may have been there, you know, particularly if we're seeing a child for chronic fluid in the middle ear space, um, if they show up with an infection, then we don't know how long that, that fluid has been there. Okay. Thank you. I think that helps. So again, that three month mark is kind of critical for us when we're seeing you know, kids with middle ear fluid. And typically by three months, like I said, 90% of them will go away. And time is, is actually one of your biggest friends here. Um, but you know, we can run into a pattern where kids get those acute middle ear infections over and over and over. Um, or if that middle ear fluid doesn't clear up after that three month mark. So what do we do in these cases? You know, we've tried multiple antibiotics, we've tried allergy medicine to clear things up. And if things are not getting better or that pattern just keeps continuing, well, that's where we come in as surgical specialists and start to you know, consider whether putting in ear tubes would be an option. So this is the most commonly performed surgical procedure in children. Um, in the United States. Um, it is an outpatient procedure, but it is surgery. Um, the child does require going completely under anesthesia. Um, it's very quick and kids bounce back pretty quickly. And the, the rationale behind this, again, remembering the anatomy with the external ear and the ear canal. So we can look in here, we can see the eardrum and the fluid or the infection is in that middle ear space. And it's this thing, this tube, the eustachian tube going to the back of the nose, that's the problem. So when this tube is not working, this eustachian tube is not draining the fluid, it's not ventilating, it's not equalizing pressure. Um, you know, it, like when you go up in an airplane, you kind of pop your ears, this is the tube that needs to open and close at the right time. So when this one's not working, we create a little bypass. So we create a little hole in the eardrum and put a, a tube in here to bypass this tube and allow the middle ear space to drain and ventilate. Um, <clears throat> so to give you an idea how big these are, there's a lot of different names. You saw in the previous slide, ventilation tubes, uh, we call them tympanostomy tubes, ear tubes, PE tubes for pressure equalization. Uh, they used to be made of a polyethylene. So some people called them PE tubes for polyethylene um, plastic. So there are different types of tubes. Uh, they all have advantages, disadvantages, um, every surgeon kind of has a personal preference, and, and I, I can't say that there's any clear-cut tube that is, is, you know, head and shoulders superior to every other. Um, but to give you an idea of the size, they're very, very small, um, judging by this, this dime here. You can't see them from the outside. The little fingers even can't even, can't even go in there and grab them. Um, so these are the actual type of tubes that we will insert um, in, the, in the eardrum. So when do we do this? So if it's happening, these acute episodes, if it's happening very frequently. So a rough guideline from our national you know, medical organizations is three episodes in six months or four in the last year, you know, with at least one of those episodes being in the last six months. So, you know, again, these are guidelines, these numbers. So if, if children are requiring antibiotics for severe episodes of acute otitis media or acute middle ear infections, you know, every other month for six months, that is kind of the threshold where we start to consider whether or not tubes would be a, a good option for this child. Um, again, that three month mark comes in into play. So if patients have middle ear fluid consecutively for three months in both ears, um, then we'd want to do a hearing test. And if there's hearing loss documented, they kind of end up on the tail end of that graph that I showed you, that last 10% that's probably not going to clear up that fluid anytime soon. And we start to think about ear tubes in those children. And then in, in the more severe cases, which fortunately we don't see as much of as we used to, but things like you know, complications of the, the most severe episodes of middle ear infection, things like mastoiditis and meningitis, things like that, which fortunately in this era are, are 
are uh, very, very uncommon. So it really comes down to kids getting a lot of ear infections. Um, and it's not just the number necessarily that we look at, um, but also the impact on quality of life um, that factors in, in a lot. Um, the, you know, I've, I've seen, you know, parents lose their jobs um, and having to take so much sick time to take their children to doctor's visits and follow-up visits and, you know, trips to the pharmacy and things like that. So, um, you know, and sleepless nights can, can really add up quickly in a, in a, you know, a family with young children. So um, those numbers are rough guidelines, um, but we really do factor in the impact on the child and the impact on the family's um, quality of life as well. Um, when we're looking at it, at whether or not this would be a good option for, for a particular child. And in addition, just because they have fluid in their ears, I wouldn't automatically recommend tubes either. Um, if they're hearing fine, um, speech development is, is adequate, they're doing well in school, socially, you know, they're, they're doing fine and not missing things, not getting in trouble with their parents from not hearing things or not, you know, missing instructions from the teacher, things like that. So if they have fluid in their ears, but their hearing is good and they're functioning really well, that's a situation I'd be very comfortable watching them. So the hearing loss is a critical um, component in the decision-making for patients with that, that middle ear fluid. As I mentioned, it's a pretty quick procedure. Um, I always, you know, we'll kind of use laughing gas as the analogy, but they will, will often get kids to sleep with, with gas anesthesia. Um, particularly in the younger kids, nobody likes to get stuck with needles, so they're able to get kids asleep with, with um, laughing gas or something equivalent, but they are completely asleep for their own comfort and their own safety. So this is a little video. So this is looking into the ear, and all this yellow stuff here is ear wax. Um, so we're looking through a little funnel-shaped instrument, and this is our um, little... Uh, we call it a cerumen curette that goes in and cleans out the earwax because we need to be able to see the eardrum adequately. Um, and that earwax can also make the diagnosis of ear infections very difficult as you might imagine. In a small child with a very small ear canal, if, if there's a lot of earwax in there, it can be difficult to get that out of there to adequately visualize the eardrum. So once we can see the eardrum here, we go in with a little sharp instrument, a little sharp knife, and make the cut right there into the eardrum. It's just a little poke or sliver, and you can see some of that clear fluid coming out. Um, I like to get that fluid out of there um, at the time. So this is our little suction. You can see it sucking some of that mucus straight out from our incision or what's called the myringotomy site there. And then here's a, a view of the tube going in. So this is a typical type of tube that we use, has a little lip that we engage and half of the tube sits on the outside of the eardrum and half of it sits on the inside of the eardrum. And in the center, you have that little hole there that's a little over a millimeter in diameter, so pretty small but that's what allows the drainage and the ventilation to occur of that middle ear space um, behind the eardrum. So as I mentioned, kids bounce back um, pretty quickly um, from this surgery. I don't require any special care. Um, you know, there are certainly some children that are more prone to earwax buildup and things like that, but, but there is no specific post-operative care or routine maintenance care that's, that's required of, of children that have tubes. Um, Contrary to times in the past, um, most of the data now says it is okay to swim um, with tubes in place. I can remember when I was growing up, you know, there was always a couple of kids that had tubes and they weren't allowed to go to pool parties or go to the beach. But, but largely we found that as long as kids are you know, in clean water, um, then they are able to, to swim. Now, some kids will wear earplugs for comfort levels. You know, they're very sensitive to water or moisture getting in their ears. Um, situations I would recommend, you know, wearing earplugs, particularly in, in older kids, if they're gonna be, you know, swimming in dirty water, you know, so a lot of lakes will have a lot of particles or sediment that gets, gets stirred up. Um, I recommend it. And in bath water by nature is, is dirty and soapy and is, creates a little higher risk of, of causing contamination and an ear infection. 
Um, but otherwise, you know, the tubes are, are seated in there. As you can see here, this is what it looks like. Um, their tubes are not going to get knocked out if kids go play sports or jump on a trampoline or, you know, do any of the, the typical kid stuff. So the idea here is, you know, we, we get kids back to normal activity pretty quickly. Um, and in fact, many kids will go back to school, daycare, normal activity the, the day after surgery. So as with any surgery, there are certain risks associated with this. So one risk is that kids can continue to get ear infections or they may get sporadic ear infections. So here's a, a picture, you can see the blue tube here. Uh, you can see mucus kind of streaming out. So, you know, I always, you know, tell parents that just because children have tubes, it's not a guarantee that they'll never get an ear infection. Now, some, some kids do really, really well, and they never have another ear infection. Other kids, because of the underlying conditions are still there, can continue with some, you know, ear infections. And with the tubes in place, all that fluid, instead of being trapped behind the eardrum, can drain out. Now, one of the advantages of having tubes is that instead of, you know, having to go on oral antibiotics or antibiotics by mouth, you can treat with ear drops because the antibiotics can go into the tube here directly to the site of the infection. So in many cases, if you have an ear infection, a middle ear infection with tubes in place, you'll typically see drainage and that can be managed with antibiotic ear drops, um, avoiding many of the side effects of, of oral or systemic antibiotics. So as I mentioned, that tube, that center hole in there is very small. It's only a little over a millimeter, millimeter and a half. So if this mucus dries up in there, it can plug the tube. Um, sometimes the tube comes out early, um, earlier than we would like, or sometimes it stays in for a couple of years. And the tubes are designed to fall out on their own. So as the eardrum grows, the tube will gradually kind of work its way out and fall into the ear canal, usually get stuck in some ear wax and fall the rest of the way out. And that time frame could be anywhere from a year or two. Um, now, depending on the type of tube, there is also a risk of leaving a tiny hole or perforation in the eardrum. So this is an example. You can see the eardrum here, and then here's the little hole that was left behind when the tube came out. Now, typically the risk of this is between one to 10% um, of, of Patients and it will depend on what type of tube that they had in there at the time. And this is also something that in some cases will eventually close up on its own. It may be entirely asymptomatic and not cause any problems, um, but it can also be patched or fixed as kids get older as well. So really the, the I think it's important you know, for us as surgeons to, to talk to the, to the families, to the parents and the caregivers, you know, what is the goal of surgery, you know, why, why are you here? Why would you want to have tubes put in your child's ears? And, you know, the, the, as I mentioned, the impact of multiple infections, multiple doctor's visits, time off of work, kids missing school, you know, we really want to understand the impact that this is having on the, the patient and the, and the family and the entire household. Uh, then we also want to, you know, consider the hearing and speech development of these children. Um, and by putting a tube in, getting that fluid out from behind the eardrum, you know, very often we can improve their, their hearing in such a way that their speech development will, will rapidly um, sort of catch up to their peers. Now, that being said, there are some kids who still need a little, you know, help with speech therapy. To, to get back uh, up to speed, but but it's really important for us to to understand why would we, we why would we consider doing this surgery in your child, and what are the both the short term and long term goals with that. So we've talked about the anatomy of the ear. We've gone over what does the term ear infections mean. Again, you know when I see a child for the first time in clinic, I I have to probe. I can't just take the the term ear infections, you know, at, at face value, because there are different types of ear infections that have different treatments. Um, we have talked about those different types, particularly the different types of, of middle ear infections as well. Um, and then briefly went over sort of the indications and, and got a short, uh, short view of the, the ear tube surgery itself and what that, um, what that involves. So some important things that I want you to remember is that, you know, many ear infections go away on their own. 
and not every ear infection, not every time that there's fluid in the ear do it, does a child need to be on antibiotics. Um, and one of the things that I've also found is how often when we you know, have a child under anesthesia and put tubes in their ears, that they're incidentally found to have pus behind their eardrum. You know, they come in the day of surgery, they have no fever, they have no symptoms. And when we make that little cut and suck the fluid out, it actually looks very similar to an, an episode of acute otitis media um, with that pus back there. So there are a lot of, of ear infections that will go away on their own. And we really want to reserve antibiotics for the, for the most severe, severe cases. Um, it's also important to remember the impact that that middle ear fluid can have on hearing loss and therefore speech delay in this, in this critical age group. Um, and remember, you know, when medical therapy and repeated medical therapy has, has failed to provide long-term benefit, that, that ear tubes are an option in, in children, either with recurrent you know, episodes of acute middle ear infection, or if they have chronic fluid in their ears, it's affecting their, their hearing. Marcia, I'm gonna turn it back over to you at this point. All right, sounds good. <clears throat> um, let's see, we got a question here. Um, this is a long one, so. <laughs> um, let's see, um, someone is suggesting that um, parents should take action if there's an ear infection and they're, they're very thankful for modern medicine. As a, a teenager who had many ear infections, ENT said there was a, a growth in their station tubes. Um, well, let's see. I'm trying to get to the. Okay. <laughs> so it's just kind of describing like kind of trying to advocate for parents to really take these things kind of seriously and, and get help when they are. They were, they were saying that they had a growth when they were a child um, that was treated with um, some sort of a surgical procedure um, to burn out some of the tissue. And um, they eventually got care through um, um, ENT and the pain was really severe. And then they ended up having like a, a, a mass um, and had to have like kind of a major surgery. And, uh, um, and now they have, I guess, um, they said they have three little bones made of titanium in their ear and their, their hearing was very compromised by that. So I guess they're kind of saying like, really, I'm thankful for that, you know, some attention was given to that and that I, I, I want to encourage other parents to not just kind of assume that, you know, uh, oh, it's an ear infection. Everything's just going to be going to be okay. So it sounds like they're just kind of sharing their experience with that. So um, we did get another question that came in. And it was really a question about swimmer's ear um, with it, you know, summertime and things like that. Are there things that they can do to prevent that? Or is there a way that they can prevent that? I know when I was a kid going to summer camp, we would always have to get drops in our ears of mm -hmm. like vinegar or alcohol, something like that. Mm -hmm. Can you talk about swimmer's ear maybe a little bit? Yep, absolutely. Um, so swimmer's ear is that other common category that I alluded to early in the, in the lecture, you know, an, an otitis externa or an infection of the of the external ear, specifically, usually an infection of the ear canal. So it's usually caused by a combination of um, some trauma to the ear canal and also moisture. So we see it very commonly in the summer. Um, people are swimming a lot. Moisture gets trapped in the ear canal. You know, then people will put Q-tips in there. It'll itch a little bit. They'll scrape. Um, you know, their ear canal and it's that combination of the moisture plus even a little bit of trauma, not even something that you would obviously recognize. Um, because the ear canal is, you know, basically right there, it's not behind the eardrum or anything, we usually recommend treating it with eardrops. Um, now, prophylactically, you know, things you can do to avoid, you know, a swimmer's ear is, you know, when you're, when you're done swimming, try to get the ear as dry as possible. You know, sometimes that's just a simple case of, you know, kind of shaking your head on a towel, some people will use a hair dryer at a low setting, you know, from a distance and kind of dry it out a little bit. Um, now an ear, the, the, the conditions that kind of set up for that, um, you know, very often the pH can get out of, out of balance. So sometimes we'll recommend like a alcohol drops, you know, rubbing alcohol or, 
we will also recommend sometimes vinegar drops. So white vinegar mix half and half either with alcohol or water. And that will help go in and kind of clean the ear canal a little bit, maintain the normal acidity of the ear canal um, and kind of create a setting where a swimmer's ear is less likely. Um, now patients, you know, patients that are prone to this can you know, either be those who produce a lot of earwax and then that earwax traps moisture or they can have, you know, the ear canal itself is not just a straight tube. So it can have different, you know, a bend or two in it. So, you know, sometimes patients have a, a very, we call it a tortuous or a bendy kind of ear canal that traps wax and traps moisture in there as well. So in, in some of those patients, they do require, you know, specialty care to come in, you know, every six months, a year, sometimes more frequently to, to clean the wax out of the ears and, and you know, keep the ear in, in good functioning shape. Okay, thank you. Um, another question that was submitted um, was uh, my child has had their eardrum ruptured um, a couple of different times, but hasn't had an ear infection in a while. Are there any long-term problems that could occur from this? So eardrum ruptures are very common. Um, and the good news is the vast majority of the time they will heal up on their own spontaneously. Probably 90% or more of, of acute eardrum perforations will heal up. And, and it's usually due to an acute ear infection that sort of just puts pressure on the eardrum and then it eventually gives way. Um, so very commonly when we see those patients, you know, they they have fevers, bad ear pain, they're kind of miserable. And then when it ruptures and all the fluid comes out, they feel better because it's released that pressure. Yeah. Um, long-term, you know, if, if the eardrum heals and the child is hearing well, there's usually not any you know, significant long-term consequences of that. Um, now, chronic perforation should certainly be evaluated if it doesn't heal up you know, on its own. Um, there are you know, always risk in those situations of you know, potentially chronic infections, things like that. Um, but it, it is something that can happen in children with acute otitis media or acute middle ear infections, but the vast majority will heal on their own. Um, now, sometimes the area of the eardrum can heal a little bit thinner, but that usually does not have any long-term consequences as far as hearing um, or function of the ear itself. Okay. Um, and this is kind of a question that really, honestly, I had it, in, in hearing your talk and, and trying to understand more about it. I kind of wondered, are obviously ear tubes are, are relieving the pain and helping clear up infection, but is it, you're not going to have it for forever. So is it kind of that I'm getting it now to prevent and help treat these ear infections for the next, I think what you said, a, a year or two that these tubes might stay in. And then at after that, they will have grown more and that they're, they're less likely to get clogged and trapped because they're not laying down as much or they're not, um, you know, they have, they have a longer space in their ear. Is that kind of? Yeah, absolutely. So I, I view ear tubes as kind of a bridge to the future, you know, to, to buy some time to allow, you know, kids to, to grow and develop and hopefully outgrow that eustachian tube dysfunction. Um, is the term we use. So that tube that drains the middle ear space to the back of the nose, um, the tubes will, you know, stay in there, like I said, a year to, you know, two years. So it's, it's really kind of buying you some time until kids will outgrow it on their own. Um, now, every kid's a little bit different. You know, some will outgrow it by two years of age, others four or six. And, you know, certainly in our practice in a in a, a, a academic medical center like ours, I mean, we see, you know, this very small percentage of patients who, you know, are teenagers and even young adults that, you know, continue to have this, but the vast majority of kids will have those ear infections in that, you know, uh, time frame when they're, you know, toddlers, and then will outgrow it usually by the time they're in elementary school. So there are cases where we put a, another set of tubes in once that first set falls out, um, if it's indicated. Um, but really the, the tube is just a temporary way to drain and ventilate the ear until the child grows and is able to drain and ventilate the ear through the natural anatomic pathway of the eustachian tube. Okay. 
All right. Well, I thank you for that. Um, I don't have any more questions that have come in right now. So uh, I think we're going to wrap it up from there. So I'd like to uh, thank you for joining us today, everyone. And uh, thank you so much for taking time out of your busy day, Dr. Collins, to give us some more information about this. And uh, I appreciate it. Thank you so much. Thank you, Marcia. I enjoyed it. Thank you. Thanks.